Well, many recent polls have shown that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's Liberals have been foundering since this summer. The latest survey from Abacus Data done last week paints a grim picture for Trudeau's party. The Conservatives are well out in front with 39% of voters at this point, 13 points ahead of the Liberals, 26%. The NDP sits at 18%, with the Bloc at 7%, with the Green Party at 5%, and the People's Party of Canada at 4% nationally. For a peek behind the numbers and the issues driving them, I'm joined by CEO of Abacus Data, David Coletto. Uh, so, David, uh, the, you know, th those, those are numbers. That, that's a pretty bad gap there for the Liberals uh, in terms of where the Conservatives are. What are the electoral numbers behind those vote intentions? I'm much trouble are they in 13 points back the liberals well i think that we, first of all the trouble is partly because these numbers have been like this now for almost five months right and i, I think we're starting to see these becoming the new normal where you're going to have consistently a conservative lead of double digits with big leads in western canada uh, atlantic canada even after this poll was done after the carbon tax kind of carve out Atlantic Canada remains uh, a challenging place for the Liberals. But interestingly, in our survey, this is the first time that we have ever numerically seen the Conservatives ahead of the Liberals in Quebec. Right. Now, I'm going to say put an asterisk there. Sample it may not, size. Sample yeah. size, and it may just be a blip, but yep. something to watch, because if, you, if Quebec is trending away from the Liberals, um, that's a place they, they kind of took for granted. That might be that might signal even bigger trouble. Right. I, I mean, their coalition of Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic. They're second in Ontario, third in Quebec, and second in the Atlantic right, right. now. I, I mean, these, this is a bad situation. But let's talk about Trudeau himself versus Pierre Polyev, who is the man whose party is in a majority position right now, on their favorability and how voters look at those leaders. Yeah. So we ask a simple question: Do you have a positive or negative view of each of the leaders? And right now, we've got uh, the prime minister with a net 24. What does that mean? 53 percent. Negative, 29% positive, with about 17% uh, who are kind of in the middle, say neutral. Now, when we compare Mr. Trudeau to, to Mr. Polyev, uh, you're starting to see a very different picture. For the first time, we have Mr. Polyev opening up a sizable net favorable advantage, 40% positive, 32 negative. Um, this is the highest positive we've had for Mr. Polyev. Um, it's probably the largest positive gap that any conservative leader has had. I think you've got to go back to probably early days of Stephen Harper. Uh, right. which signals two things. One is very unpopular prime minister up against an increasingly liked and popular conservative uh, leader. So, so when you look at this, 13 points behind in the top line numbers with the conservatives in a majority territory based on historic voting outcomes, trailing in the three key battlegrounds and probably in British Columbia as well, yeah. I, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. And those leadership numbers, I mean, is there a path back here for the Liberals? I know we're two years away from an election, a lot of people, potentially, and a lot of people haven't totally made up their mind. But what does a path back look like for them with these underlying challenges? Well, we, we tried to actually find that out. So we asked people who said, uh, I'm not supporting the Liberals right now or I'm undecided. Is there still a chance you might do that or are you completely shutting the door to the Liberals? And about one in three of those non-Liberal supporters do say there's still a chance I could vote for the party. Two out of three of those who say they voted for the party in 2021 say there's still a chance. So there is a chance. But if you think that they barely won the 2021 election, yeah. barely won the 2019 election, they basically have to convert all of that 31 percent back to the Liberals, which can be done, but is, I think, going to be increasingly hard to do unless, unless some of the other numbers change. People got to feel better about the prime minister and they have to feel that Mr. Polyev isn't a great alternative. It's like that dumb and dumber meme. So you're telling me there's a chance, right? Because statistically, chance. but it's, hey, it's a narrow path. David, at, next at this year, point, next right? week, you might be reporting on a new crisis that completely upends everything we we're talking about. Yep. But if you look at these baseline numbers, in the eight years the Liberals have been in office, they have not been this bad. So, so in the absence of something that you know fundamentally shakes perceptions at this point, what what are the issues that the non-liberal supporters are considering when, when making their decision on, on who to vote for? What what are the core things in the electorate's mind? Yeah, well, we actually asked the question like, what what might change? What might you make you more likely to vote liberal? Um, mm -hmm. One of them, a third of past liberal supporters, said, well, if Justin Trudeau wasn't the liberal leader, I might be willing to to consider him. That's a that's you know plus twenty in terms of its net impact. Uh, economic effects, if the economy starts to improve, maybe if mortgage interest rates start to drop, you can yeah. see there a significant portion of people might move over to the Liberals. And there's still, to your point about people not being completely sort of baked into their view, what if it became clear that the, uh, Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives could win the election? Or what if you became uncomfortable with Pierre Polyev? You're seeing large numbers of people, particularly those past Liberal supporters, 
including current New Democrat supporters saying, that might make me uh, go and vote liberal. So there are a number of factors, more than one of these might actually end up happening, that still creates an opportunity for the liberal. So the door is not shut on another liberal government, but a lot of different things probably have to happen to make it more likely to happen. So, so just to, if I can ask a, a final question, just to broaden it out a little bit, like we're seeing that here in Canada in a time of high inflation and high cost of living, we're seeing it in the United States too, yeah. where Joe Biden is, is underwater in some, some key swing states, seeing it in the United Kingdom. Is this just, how much of this is specific to Trudeau and the liberals and how much of it is a product of incumbency in a time of inflation and economic challenge? I think it is. I mean, there will be some who argue Trudeau and the government have made some choices that have turned people sure. off, but fundamentals are inflation kills governments. Inflation, when you've been in government for eight years, makes it even more deadly. And I think that is really what they're up against. They don't have easy solutions to make people feel more comfortable. And they're facing that challenge, as you said, just like other incumbents across the world. All right, David Coletto, the CEO of Abacus Data. Always appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thanks, David. Okay, I, I want to sh show a couple of numbers from the Abacus Data poll. We just had David Coletto on, and I want to show uh, a control room, if I can, first the top line number, the vote intention. Uh, Abacus was in the field after the government announced the carbon tax carve out on home heating oil, which applies nationally, but was primarily driven by concerns in Atlantic Canada. The Liberals are behind by 13 points, uh, according to these numbers. And then I want to show, if we can, just the leaders, the net favorability on, on, on what's happened here. And, and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, if you look at the people who have a favorable impression of him versus a negative impression, he, he's at a net minus 24, uh, which is uh, a, a rough spot for uh, someone seeking a fourth mandate to be. And look up here, Polyev uh, Vandana, he's plus eight. He's got a net favorable rating. I don't know the last time I've seen that for a conservative leader, Vandana. H how are liberals looking at these numbers, first reported uh, by our colleague Susan Delacourt in the Toronto Star? How do you see it? No, I don't think anyone's surprised by this, really, because you know this government after eight years, it's normal for governments to face these type of issues. And look what this government has been facing: you know, crises after crises. Donald Trump, a new NAFTA, a global pandemic, um, two international crises, and you know, an economic downturn. So, you know, the government and the prime minister has been the face of it. Um, he has the main lead communicator, so people will get tired of it. But at the same time, you know, there's still a lot of time where the, the PM can present, you know, what his vision is and what his solutions. And you touched upon it. You know, Pierre Polyev is really good at pointing out what the problems are. But we have yet to hear what the solutions are. And I think when it comes down to the ballot box question, you know, as much as people want change, you know, they'll want to know what the vision is for the country. And I think it's very clear what the PM has. And, you know, I read from David Coletto's polling that some people want to know what his vision is, and that's fair. You know, but he has time to share that and share that in this economic time, what his plan is for the government and how do we move forward as a country and globally. Um, so I think there's still, I wouldn't count him out yet. Um, and I think there's a lot of time still to make that up. Okay, I, I want to look at, Brad, uh, these are some other numbers from, from, from David's poll on sort of like, I guess, the path forward, things that could change uh, to give the Liberals a chance uh, to come back. And, and essentially what it boils down to is the possibility of a new leader in the Liberal Party would be a net benefit uh, uh, for the Liberals, uh, people say. And if, for example, mortgage interest rates started to drop, if the Canadian economy approved, and then if they had more doubts about what a Pierre Polyev government might do. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with Mr. Trudeau or how people are going to feel about Pierre Polyev, but if they stick with the two-year election runway, there is a chance interest rates and the economy could be changing in a more positive direction. So how wide is the path for a liberal recovery here, or is it just a go path, Brad? Well, and the other thing you need to consider is that this is a path as of like late October, early November 2023. That mm -hmm. path will obviously change with time if interest rates change. Uh, that's that's a possibility uh, that the path could also change. But I mean, you know, new leader. The, the the challenge that political parties have when they poll their current leader with 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 a potential new leader is that it's it's usually theoretical, especially if no other yeah. names are put there. If you said, would you be more likely to vote for the Liberal Party of Canada if Trudeau was a leader or if? you know, Mark Carney was a leader, or if uh, Christian Freeland was a leader, whatever. That, you have apples to apples. When you say a new leader, then people can impose a, a theoretical, you know, the, the numbers should be inflated because people then will impose uh, somebody better than Trudeau. But if they chose somebody that was actually worse than Trudeau, then the likelihood of them voting liberal actually right. goes down instead of up. So you got to, one, one must be careful with that. Uh, one also must be careful about, like, uh, you know, 
you know, whether mortgage rates, it could be something different uh, in 12, 18, or 22 months from now that replaces mortgage that, that Trudeau doesn't have any control over. Could be, you know, calmer waters globally. Could be, you know, things like uh, international supply chain, whatever. Yep. These things, none of which Trudeau is in charge of. The real thing, though, if you take a look at some of these other tables in Coletto's poll, are things like people that even voted liberal last time are tired of them, don't yeah. believe he's got a vision for the country, uh, not, not in it anymore, doesn't have that fight or passion. Those are things that he does have control over. And so, you know, you know, last week we were talking about Percy Down, the senator, saying he should take a walk in the snow in Feb. He should actually take a walk in the leaves in November to figure out whether or not he's going to put that vision together because now is the time to start... Uh, offering that to Canadians, right. not waiting for this to solidify. And Coletto mentioned that. He said the problem that they have is this is the fifth month now where the Tories have a double-digit lead and Trudeau's negatives keep sinking. The time to turn it around is not in 24 months, it's actually now. Right, and, and look, and, and everybody at home saying, oh, you're overreacting to a poll two years out. Yes, it's potentially two years before an election, but this is the reality in the here and now. And Rob, this is the, the, the period in which they have to make some decisions, whether they make a change as a Liberal government or whether they just change their policy and approach and their communication strategy and all of that. Where do you see it? Uh, and I, I can guarantee you, David, that, uh, that Mr. Coletto isn't the only one polling. I can guarantee you that there are people in the Liberal Party who are polling night after night after night to find out if the Prime Minister is a drag or a potential help to his party. If he's the guy like, like Stephen Harper who can't win but might leave the party in very good shape in terms of number of seats right. and money in the bank after an election. Uh, that, that work is probably being done and I imagine that the Prime Minister will make his decision as to whether he really stays or goes based on what that research is, although guys in this position are often very stubborn about uh, hanging on to the job. But I, 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 I think that Brad is absolutely right. If he's going to, even, even if he's going to go, he's got to get in the game. It mm. just doesn't look like he's in the game. The game is now being controlled by Pierre Poilievre. Uh, and uh, the Liberals have to decide what they're going to do before a budget, during a budget, their time is running out. Um, you know, the, the campaign, if, if we're going in, into the, the fourth year of a Liberal mandate, the campaign really begins next year. Yeah, and, and as Brad says, a lot of global factors can change, and they're outside of Justin Trudeau's control, though I yeah. watch Question Period every day, and apparently it's all him. But, you know, you know, Lisa, one of the things you, you talk to liberals about in terms of whether he should mm -hmm. stay and what he should do, a lot of people point to his capacity as a campaigner, and mm -hmm. Justin Trudeau is incredible on the campaign trail, like mm -hmm. to sustain the energy and pace for five, six weeks that he does. And they feel he could go up against a guy like Polyev, who may be the first conservative leader to sort of match that energy and tenacity. And if it's not Trudeau... Who the heck can go up against him for five, six weeks in that sort of an arena? All I know is that when he put the numbers up, 39, 26, 18, 5, that's the 2012 majority with the Conservatives. Mm. Like, if I saw those numbers in southwestern Ontario, I'd be ecstatic because the splitting between the Liberal and the NDP. So it may not be as much about trying to make sure that they downgrade Pierre. They're going to have to start separating from their coalition partner a little bit more <laughs> and have to pivot and say, if you want to stop Pierre you got to go with me. And well, that's really what the play is going to have to be in the ridings in Ontario. I, I, I thought we agreed that after today it's the Conservative NDP coalition. <laughs> oh. Vanya, I'm just kidding. Vanya, just give you the, the, the last word on this because we've got to say goodbye after this. I, I mean, what, what do you think uh, the Liberals can do? What do you think they will do? I think they're going to focus still on affordability and on the key messages that people are focused on in terms of, you know, their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. I think also you're going to see the PM engaging with people more and, you know, you said it yourself, like he is the best campaigner. He can outpace anyone. He can go from a Monday to a Diwali event, to a senior's home, et cetera, and get energy from people. And, and people can feed off that energy. So I think you're going to see that. You're going to see them you know, reset a bit more. The problem is they keep getting these crises. But I think what you're seeing that despite the crises happening, you're seeing them still focus on things like affordability. And you're going to see that in the long run, I don't think the Liberals are, you know, they're not naive to what's happening and they're going to be focused on winning the next election. Okay, uh, gang, we covered a lot of ground, but we're out of time. I want to thank you all. To the, thanks to the Power Panel, Rob Russo, Lisa Raitt, Vanda Nakata, and Brad Levine.